I have to say that you are about to hear something uh, that uh, opened my eyes a few years ago at one conference in Malta. It was Theory and Practice in Digital Libraries. Uh, Dr. Uh, Soren or gave the most amazing talk that for me was aha moment what linked data is about and what linked data can do. So uh, Dr. Soren is, as you know, uh, probably read in the uh, book that he's uh, with the University of Bonn and uh, he has done outstanding work uh, that you are about to hear. It's my great honor that uh, this time he accepted the invitation uh, and I'm actually excited that he is among uh, the invited, uh, the keynote speakers together with uh, Dario and the invited speakers Ruben and Pedro, one of my favorite people in the semantic web world. So please help me welcome Dr. Soren Auer. Thank you very much, Violetta, for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here, actually. You should hear me as well, uh, like this. Um, I think Vivo is really a great, uh, great example of how scholarly communication can be improved, like an open software, not only open in terms of open source, uh, but also in terms of open knowledge and an open community. And I think we need many more of these examples. Um, in my talk, I would like to look a bit at a broader view of scholarly communication, um, not only at research information systems, uh, but scholarly communication in general. I also will not talk so much about linked data because I assume many of you, most of you, know linked data and semantic technologies. Um, but if we look a bit back, how did uh, publishing uh, communication uh, start. I was investigating a bit um, in preparation for this talk. So um, around 8,000 years ago already people started to uh, develop uh, sign systems um, and there are these Jiahu symbols uh, which have 16 different markings and uh, which can be uh, found um, in the Henan uh, province in China um, in a Neolithic uh, culture which used already some uh, symbols for, for communication. Uh, we then have 2,000 years ago uh, hieroglyphs in, in uh, Egypt and um, this is an example of the Papyrus of Ani, basically a book which was written for people when they die to help them uh, to progress in their afterlife, to give them advice, to reflect on what they have done in their life and um, that was something um, uh, created uh, 4, 000, around 4,000 years ago, uh, 380 before our area. We had the um, Greek uh, period and, uh, for example, Plato's Republic, like a, a book or document which discusses um, how um, justice uh, should be developed, how governance structures in a society should be developed, um, which is an example of, of maybe early scholarly communication, if we can call it like this. Then we had the medieval ages, uh, still documents were handwritten, uh, especially in monasteries, uh, monks were uh, writing, uh, copy, copying books basically. This is an example, uh, Codex Gigas, um, the largest extant medieval manuscript, uh, which was created in a Benedictine monastery uh, in what is today uh, Bohemia. It actually was, um, stolen by, uh, in the uh, war by the Swedish king, Gustav Adolf, and it's now in, in Stockholm, if you want to look at this manuscript. Um, and um, a large part of it is um, a Latin version of the Bible, but then there are also discussions, and it's especially famous for its depiction of the devil. Uh, so you have a, a large uh, depiction of the devil in this kind of, kind of book. And then um, scientific publishing in the, in the modern age uh, started, of course, there was uh, book printing invented, and in the 17th century, uh, the first scientific journals uh, appeared. So this here is an example um, of the philosophical transaction of the Royal Society, uh, which were printed um, in uh, 1665. Um, 
And um, since then, scholarly communication evolved. Um, and nowadays, we use mainly PDFs, uh, but we still write articles as uh, relatively static uh, documents. Um, uh, and a large part of our communication um, is based on exchanging scientific articles in PDF. Um, I would say they are only partially machine readable uh, PDF documents. A lot of the structure is actually lost. So for example, if you have a table in a PDF document which stretches over several pages, you cannot distinguish that is it one table, is it several tables, what are the columns, what are the rows. So this, all this information is, is lost. Um, also, it does not allow embedding of semantics, only maybe on a coarse-grained uh, document level. Um, there is not so much or no interactivity, dynamicity. It's difficult to repurpose um, PDF documents and um, many limitations. So if we look back at these six, 8,000 years of, of communication, scholarly communication, has it changed much? I would say in terms of distribution, yes. Yeah, we have almost zero cost of copying and distribution nowadays. Uh, like in the medieval ages, we still had to write the books by hand. So this was extremely expensive and, uh, of course, a major obstacle for knowledge sharing. And in that terms, we really made a big leap forward and we made a big progress. Um, but if you look a bit at this history, it's mainly a history about reducing the marginal costs of publishing. Yeah? So making it cheaper to publish things and to distribute uh, published uh, documents. But in terms of the methods we use for um, encoding uh, or for communicating and for representing knowledge and information, I think not that much has changed. It looks pretty much um, as in the, in the very beginning. So articles are pretty fixed successions of characters and words. Um, they are quite static in terms of representation, content, granularity. So I think we need something like a paradigm change and think about new ways of how we can organize scholarly communication. Um, because researchers spend a lot of time in encoding their findings in research articles. Um, and on the other end, other researchers spend a lot of time in decoding uh, from articles, finding related work, getting overview of the state of the art in a certain area. And this is quite cumbersome, time-consuming, because it requires reading lots of these PDF documents um, and then putting basically the puzzle pieces together and um, takes many years. And I think this can be done, uh, I hope it can be done more efficiently. So I think we need uh, to develop uh, means to make scholarly communication more efficient, effective, and which particularly use these um, opportunities which we have in a digitized world. Uh, what are these? Um, we, have, uh, we can really have machine-readable documents. Meanwhile, we can semantically represent the content um, in documents, uh, so make them not only human-friendly, human-readable, but also machine-readable, so that the machines can assist us in digesting and finding and retrieving uh, the right information at the right time. Uh, we can make the content also more dynamic, um, integrate interactive examples, um, have different levels of granularity, um, mark maybe parts in documents which are required to read for, uh, for uh, beginners, but other parts which um, uh, are relevant for more advanced uh, readers. Uh, we can integrate multimedia content in documents nowadays. Who reads PDFs on paper? Most people use, meanwhile, tablet PCs or uh, computers and um, rarely you print really documents or you read uh, printed uh, material and I think this will decrease um, in the future and we have lots of devices which allow digital uh, digitized um, reading digestion of information already. So we can interlink also documents with context, context meaning related work, calls, reviews, comments, discussions and interlinking it in a machine-readable way so that a machine can actually uh, understand what does this reference mean? Is it related work? Is it uh, uh, work uh, this approach is based on? Is it um, some counterexample? Um, also comments, discussions, and uh, reviews, for example, all these kind of um, information or, or elements which are part of scholarly communication can be um, interlinked. We can add um, rich metadata, 
uh, for example, about provenance, licensing. Um, and a very important part is improving the collaboration and making collaboration more interactive so that you don't sit in your room locked up and, and work on your papers, but that you communicate, that you exchange ideas with others, that you have better means and techniques for collaborating um, on your um, research. So um, I want to talk about some of these aspects in more detail and then give you some examples. So one is machine readability. Uh, I already mentioned PDFs. A lot of the information structure about the documents is actually lost headings, paragraphs, tables, references are not recognizable easily anymore. Uh, we have to, of course, there are some services which try to reverse engineer and, and uh, access this information, but um, the quality is not always uh, very good there, and we can add only semantics on a um, per document level. Um, I think we need to add more semantics to documents. Uh, for open data, there is this five-star scheme, uh, which Tim Berners-Lee developed, um, uh, which helps a bit uh, organizations to publish open data in a um, more um, richer way. So the, you get a, a first star if you publish um, open data as PDF documents. Of course, it's only partially machine readable. Uh, once you publish it in a fully machine readable format like XLS, for example, you already get two stars. When it's an open format like CSV, you have three stars. Uh, once you add um, identifiers for uh, the, the data, the information in there, uh, for example, using RDF, uh, you have four stars. And once you link it with other relevant information, you have five stars. So this is Tim's uh, five-star model for open data. And there were already some ideas also to having a similar uh, approach for scholarly document uh, documents and um, journal articles to have some such a SCADAR scheme where we lift uh, documents to uh, more semantic uh, richness and um, more um, interlinked documents. I want to give you um, also an example how, how this can, can look like. Um, if you look at the document uh, currently, um, we can add or try to represent a part of the information which is encoded in the text also as um, in RDF in a semantics aware format. So here, for example, it's a paper which describes an approach. And um, uh, most of you should know this um, RDF triple subject predicate object, which expresses facts, um, information about a certain entity. Here about the uh, paper, Lyme's paper, which describes an approach. We can um, uh, say uh, that this um, um, entity which is identified uh, is actually an approach for a certain um, um, technique, link discovery in that case. Uh, this is a very simplified example. Um, then we can say that it has certain properties. One of the properties can be, for example, that's a loseless approach, which is very important for link discovery. There are loseless um, approaches and approaches which uh, lose certain precision. Um, and have uh, then better performance. It's a trade-off between the two. And this can be described here in this kind of subject predicate object facts. Uh, we can also describe an implementation which is uh, contained or described in the paper. Uh, implementation implements this approach. Um, it's implemented in a certain programming language, for example, Java. Um, and we can describe an evaluation. So these are usually the three parts of many papers where you have an approach which is presented, you have an implementation, and you have an evaluation. And uh, the evaluation um, evaluates the implementation of the approach that it uses a certain data set for evaluation. And by describing the information contained in the paper in such a semantic way, you can then actually uh, run queries if, if many uh, authors would do that. Um, you can ask for all link discovery approaches which have certain properties, uh, which have implementations in a certain programming language, or use a certain uh, data set for evaluation purposes. And this currently, to answer such uh, questions, requires you quite a lot of digging in uh, repositories, reading papers, finding out um, uh, what the, how they are implemented, how they are evaluated. Um, and by running such queries, you could much easier get an overview of the state of the art in a certain field or of related work um, to your 
uh, research. So this is a bit the internal view that we internally represent um, documents, articles, um, and add more semantics to them. Uh, but of course, also externally, interlinking it, giving it more context with related work. Um, uh, so here you see a small uh, graph which um, describes, for example, research which is performed in reply to a certain call or published uh, in a certain uh, with uh, in reply to a certain call. It appears in a, a collection uh, which has editors and chairs which create these proceedings. Uh, which is then hosted at some library or institution. Um, we have certain annotations which are created by contributors. There is feedback and reviews which are maybe um, attached to the document. So there is a number of information also surrounding um, uh, research documents which can be interlinked and, and represented in a semantic way. So, and that's a bit my vision that we can add more uh, semantic, more structure. Of course, it's very difficult to change a working system. Currently, everything is based on these workflows of uh, PDF articles in journals, in conferences, um, in publishers. Um, and it will be very challenging to actually change this established system uh, because we have a lot of tooling, we have a lot of uh, support infrastructure, a lot of knowledge. Uh, many people use LaTeX, for example, which is a very a fine, nice system for typesetting, but uh, we need new tools which actually can implement and realize such new uh, semantics aware ways of scholarly communication. I want to present you um, some um, ideas and some attempts in that regard. The first one targeting particularly also this publishing and authoring collaboration approach, uh, which is um, called linked research and um, the implementation locally. Uh, and the work is mainly done by Sovereign um, a PhD student of mine um, who works on these topics, who is very um, passionate and ambitious uh, to um, um, bring this forward. And um, he developed this Dokili client side editor for de uh, decentralized article publishing, for annotations, adding annotations to articles, and uh, also social interactions, because in the end, it's something like a social network we work on. So Dokili allows you to write and publish articles in a space which you control, um, like in your web space, for example. You can save them and edit them directly in place. Um, it doesn't use a heavyweight content management infrastructure. It's based on very standard uh, web technologies. Um, so you can use almost um, um, common web space. Um, and a lot of the implementation is done client side. Um, it allows you to annotate. Uh, articles to reply uh, and share articles, uh, to get notified, uh, to embed uh, live data, scripts, statistics, multimedia, to add identifiers and semantic markup in any concepts. So it also allows this repurposing and, and sharing. Um, people can remix, uh, clone, and tweak other information. Um, you can create different views of, of the information. So there's not only one um, PDF view, but uh, there are different kind of views which can be rendered by means of style sheets. Um, um, it's uh, open source, of course, under development. Um, there are a lot of um, glitches and problems still, but I think it quite uh, shows uh, the potential uh, which is there uh, to improve maybe scientific uh, knowledge sharing. It uses um, a lot of modern web technologies. Um, basically, the main um, representation formalism is HTML, um, HTML5 with uh, RDFA annotations, which you can embed. You can embed RDF um, to semantically represent uh, information inside HTML and um, another, a number of other techniques. Um, there are a number of requirements um, and uh, different concepts which should be supported, not only the authoring, but also publishing, peer review, interactions with peers, um, call for papers, uh, proceedings which are compiled, archives and persistence that you have profiles, uh, you can reference other work, um, and that it um, also tackles the, um, um, the requirements of, of different stakeholders, which are not only researchers, but reviewers, editors, funders, students, 
and citizens in general. So how does this work, uh, Dokili? And the best is I show you a small uh, video, a screencast. Uh, so we have um, here um, Liz um, on the left side who works on an article um, called This Paper is a Demo, uh, which is actually not by Liz, but by Sovereign and, um, uh, and me as a co-author. And we have on the other side uh, virtually Jean-Luc, who is maybe something like a supervisor, a reviewer of the, of the article, um, and uh, Liz wants to collaborate and share this work with him. So you see on the left-hand side the article a bit in a kind of blog post style format, um, and then uh, Liz shares this uh, with uh, Jean-Luc, and he prefers a more um, um, research way of presenting it. So this is a style sheet which renders the article then in the ACM uh, style, for example. And you see here there are different other ways of, of styling the, the information. You can also change to uh, that's the Sp Springer layout. And if you pr print um, the article, it would uh, pretty much look like a, a PDF generated uh, from, from the LaTeX template of Springer or ACM. We even talked to, uh, to ACM and to Springer. They were quite uh, impressed what can be done with um, HTML, CSS uh, style sheets um, and have a quite consistent uh, layout. But um, you see also that this is not a static um, article, but it contains uh, dynamic parts here. So since it's HTML, you can embed all kinds of, of things in HTML, like videos, even um, applications. So uh, what we see here is an application uh, which allows to visualize data um, and you can um, analyze statistical data. You also have here a query interface uh, for, for querying uh, the data. And then you can sign in with the web ID. So this is also something using standard uh, web technologies um, to, um, in order to collaborate uh, on the article. And then you can press this edit button um, and you actually can mark up or edit um, the content directly in your web browser. So here Jean-Luc is selecting a part and he has some comment. And you see you have such an edit interface which allows you uh, to edit the article or to add annotations. Here in that case, he adds an annotation, um, also adds a license for his annotation. You see it's then added on the right-hand side um, as a side note. And then um, when Liz gets back to her article, she can see this annotation. These annotations are actually stored um, um, also as small documents. Uh, so they are, there is no content management system behind it, but it just uses HTML, um, HTTP um, put, uh, the put protocol um, of HTTP to store this small annotation document in, a, in something called an inbox. So in your web space, you can define a certain um, subspace, an inbox where other people can store small documents and these small documents are annotations which um, refer to your articles and then uh, they are directly also visualized um, when you browse and look at the article in the web browser. So now also Liz signs in, she edits uh, the article, she selects uh, the comment and she uh, changes the article accordingly to the suggestion of Jean-Luc, uh, saves it to her own web space, um, yeah, and then uh, the article is basically updated. So this was um, giving you a small um, overview of uh, Dokili, where you directly edit and, and represent information uh, using HTML, which adds a lot of um, additional features. And maybe one more small example, which is also quite, um, quite nice, is uh, these um, uh, Spark clients, which allow you insight. Uh, so when you edit such a Dokili document, you can also add these uh, spark lines, which are small interactive inline charts when you have a sparkle endpoint in the back and then inside uh, the document um, you see um, these small charts here for the GDP of Canada, for example, um, and um, by means of the Sparkle endpoint, there are different uh, views of the data which then can be added uh, directly inline such documents and which can automatically also update when the uh, when the data changes. So um, these 
Dokili and linked research um, uh, documents, they are not only human, but also very machine friendly. Um, they use uh, HTML markup and semantic annotations uh, using microformats or RDF, um, HTML, uh, RDF, um, RDFA inside uh, the HTML5 documents. Uh, you can add all kinds of interactive um, elements like videos, audio, JavaScript applications, code examples, and use all the JavaScript infrastructure. There are so many JavaScript libraries and um, uh, components out there which can be used for visualizing data, for example, or for highlighting, syntax highlighting of certain code examples. It supports these different views um, like ACM, LNCS, um, you can also create slideshows from your presentation, so you can develop your paper presentation and uh, the, the slideshow presentation at the same time. And it builds on this linked data platform concepts and SOLID, uh, which is developed by Tim Berners-Lee, a project at MIT. Um, uh, so it's a relatively lightweight infrastructure based on standard web technologies and not like a big uh, big platform and it's very decentralized or completely decentralized. So there is no central server required. Uh, you just need an, a web space which supports this um, 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 <clears throat> um, mechanisms to, uh, to upload small documents, for example, via put, HTTP put, um, and uh, to realize this web ID and notifications. Yeah, uh, it also allows to interlink a research article to give interlink the articles or the, the content with more context. So for example, with um, um, workshop proceedings, so what we see here is an article linked uh, statistical data analysis, uh, which is in reply for certain call for papers here, uh, published at the SEMSTATS workshop, um, which again is part of um, um, uh, I think ISWC, International Semantic Web Conference, um, where the workshop was held and uh, co-located. Uh, the proceedings are at Kerr workshop proceedings. Um, um, and um, there is also another uh, representation, basically, of this publication at Kerr workshop proceedings. And Kerr, meanwhile, uh, another colleague of mine, Christoph Lange, he's the technical editor of the Kerr workshop proceedings. Uh, the new uh, method in the Kerr workshop proceedings is also to add these RDFA annotations directly to the proceedings that you really have this uh, semantic context and the links to the call for papers, for example, and the individual uh, publications and to close this loop. Of course, um, Dokili is not, uh, not the only one. There are a number of other approaches in the area, and we collected a number of a bit more detailed requirements. So, for example, access control, attribution is very important, adaption to different audiences, uh, being able to add commenter, comments and feedback, supporting this decentralized authoring and publication, and I think that's uh, something which not many other approaches support. Uh, so this is... Um, here, this column, there is Fidus Writer, uh, which uh, also aims to provide such a tool for distributed, decentralized authoring, um, where we also, by the way, work very closely with the uh, people uh, developing Fidus Writer. Um, then we have uh, identifiers, feedback and interactions, that you have this machine, human machine readability. Um, that you can integrate authoring and publication workflows. Uh, you have interactive content, um, impact metrics. That's something uh, currently no one implements yet. Um, integration of semantics uh, mentioned already of multimedia, uh, provenance and accountability, persistence, preservation, and then also sharing and the social interaction um, is, I think, very important aspect. So this, um, this was an overview of, a um, brief overview of Dokili, like one approach going in this direction of having a more semantic representation, a more dynamic, interactive representation of uh, scholarly communication content. Um, another um, work we currently do is um, um, a research information system, but with a different focus than Vivo. Vivo, I think, focuses a lot on an organizational perspective, that you have a university or an institute, and you want to give an overview of um, the research which is done by uh, the members of this uh, organization. 
Uh, but I think we also need sometimes maybe some other types of research information systems. Of course, they all should work together. That's why the semantic representation is very important to have this shared conceptualizations, ontologies, uh, which can be linked and integrated. And one area where we found uh, there is not much support are events. Of course, they are very important in computer science, not so much maybe in other fields of research, uh, but still uh, events are one of the key crucial elements in scholarly communication. And uh, my impression is it's currently very difficult to get an overview of events, uh, scientific events, um, in particular in terms of quality. Uh, for example, you want to see what were the acceptance rates of this conference in the last five years, um, what are the PC, who are the PC members, um, where are the events located, what are the fees um, of attending uh, the conference, what are the submission dates, registration, and so on, what co-located events are there. Of course, you can find this information on the website of each individual event, but it's very difficult to get an overview in a certain area and domain. For those who are uh, long in a certain community, they have an overview of the events in the area, but for newcomers, young PhD students, this is very uh, difficult and they need a lot of advice and support maybe from more senior people. <clears throat> so in order to address this, um, problem or gap in um, uh, information, better data about events, we developed a, a semantic wiki called Open Research, uh, which gives you the possibility to add call for papers and to add structured semantic represented information about events. And uh, this is the entry page. Unfortunately, it's a bit small here to read, uh, but it gives you um, different um, entry points to this information about scientific events is actually not only limited to events, but that's the um, uh, focus area currently. So you can browse by field of science, you can browse by uh, type of content, so conferences, workshops, event series, but also other um, types like fora or projects, organizations, people which are involved there. Um, and you can also browse by regions, that's here on the button, you can look uh, what events are there in digital libraries, for example, in Europe or in South America, and then you can get an overview of, of events in a certain domain, in a certain field. Um, how can you um, add information? Or the basic idea is it's a semantic wiki that everyone can add his um, call for papers, his information about his events. Mo many of you maybe have, have seen WikiCFP. Uh, it's a bit similar. It's also called Wiki, but I don't think WikiCFP actually is a wiki uh, because it just, uh, you cannot really edit uh, the calls there. Usually characteristic of a wiki is that you have revision version control. Everybody can collaborate. Um, that's not possible in, in WikiCFP and you only have very few metadata. You have just uh, important dates um, and the locations of the events. Here we want to give much more detail or the possibility to add much more detailed information about events. Uh, not only the dates, but also who are the chairs, where is it located. Of course, what uh, co-located events are there? Uh, what event series does it belong to? Um, so you have the structured uh, event metadata. And then you, of course, have the call for papers or the call for contributions. And you can add, as in a semantic wiki, the semantic annotations. For example, here we have the committee. You can link the committee members and, um, and annotate that uh, these are PC chairs or PC members and so on. Um, you edit uh, this. Um, we also added a more um, user-friendly way of, of editing the metadata. So you have forms for gathering the, uh, the data about events. Um, we also want to extract this um, automatically, but that's still work in, in progress from the call for papers. And um, um, you, it also uses, for example, the um, information, the meta structure data, which is already available as background knowledge. So if you want to add PC members, uh, or, or PC chairs, it already suggests also people which are already, were already chairs or um, uh, participated in a certain uh, function um, in other events. And then you have uh, additional data, like for example, the fees uh, for attending the event, uh, the number of submitted papers, uh, the accepted papers, which allows them to compute the acceptance rate, which is one important quality criteria for, for events. You can add proceedings, uh, bibliography, 
um, and, so, um, and so on and so forth. And this allows you in the end to generate different views of these events. You not only can see upcoming events, but you can also see events in a certain uh, area. Uh, you can look, for example, for conferences with uh, ordered by acceptance rate, uh, so which we see here. Uh, so there are queries possible which allow you to query this uh, metadata and information. You can depict it on a timeline. Um, what are the events in a certain area? Uh, when are they taking place? Uh, you can create a calendar view. Um, you can also look at one event series here that's the extended semantic web conference or previously European semantic web conference. And you can also see who were the uh, general chairs PC chairs, how did the acceptance rate develop over time, and you can get a much better overview and picture, of course, of these events. It, of course, requires that uh, um, people we, we, um, have some automatic means to extract information and to integrate information, but um, I'm, um, it's also very important for people to collaborate on that and to, to add maybe some information uh, with the form-based um, approach is very easy, relatively easy to add um, data and information here uh, to this semantic wiki. And we now have information about thousands of conferences already uh, and lots of event series um, in there. The nice thing is that not only uh, you can crowdsource or collaborate on the data, but also on the application, actually. You can create your own queries, your own visualizations on such a semantic wiki. So what you see here is um, the syntax to create a query, and everybody who has an account or who, who um, um, has a login at the semantic wiki, and we uh, create one for, for everyone. It's not completely open because we got a lot of spam previously, and we had to find spam, so now we manually um, add accounts here, but once you have an account, you can basically also create your own queries and your own views of the data and query the information and have these interactive queries, for example, maybe conference calendar just for your research group um, or uh, other views of the information. And there is this semantic media wiki syntax which allows you to uh, create these kind of queries. So that's, by the way, the query uh, to show uh, the information on the previous page. Here the um, basically information about a conference series and all the different columns you have here in this table basically are part of the, of the query um, which are added there. It's a different syntax, not Sparkle. Um, it's actually a bit simpler. You also don't have the full power of Sparkle, uh, but it's relatively easy to, to learn this query syntax and to create uh, some um, simple queries. And of course, also, once you add a person as a PC member, um, we can also create a personal profile page uh, where then the PC memberships or and, and organization committee memberships of this person are listed. So um, when you add content, it not only updates one page, but potentially also different pages in the wiki are updated in different views. And that's also a very powerful mechanism. Um, and here you see a profile. Uh, of me, and then uh, if I'm added somewhere um, in the events in open research, it will automatically also update this profile page. So I already mentioned the core of the architecture is uh, Semantic Media Wiki, which I think is a very great um, uh, platform for developing also semantic application. Uh, we use a number of extensions like the semantic forms, which and different visualizations and uh, queries for predefined views. Uh, there is a Sparkle endpoint, so you can query all this data also using Sparkle. There is an RDF triple store, which is synchronized with the original MediaWiki uh, database. And um, we work also on integrating this with um, other sources, uh, like importing uh, data uh, from, from different sources. Um, uh, there is, for example, a similar initiative uh, scholarly data, uh, which also has a lot of information about events, and uh, we can integrate and, and interlink that with related um, information. Yeah, so this is open research, and you are invited to create an account and or to, to first see what's in there. Uh, I think Vivo Conference is not in there yet. Maybe I will add it later today. 
Um, and then, um, yeah, at your favorite events to, uh, to open research and, and use it. And I think the more people currently, we still uh, lack a bit of critical mass, but once we have a critical mass of users, I think it will be a very valuable resource, and especially also for young researchers to get an overview of the events in a certain area. And I think this was a bit a gap um, previously. It was very difficult to, to find. And my impression is lots of research groups, they create their own event calendar and um, uh, it would be nice to use such a platform to collaborate on that. And now um, another um, example of um, um, a technology or a uh, platform uh, to support uh, scholarly communication. I, I think a very important aspect is also educational content. Once you uh, perform research in an area, at some point you are also required to uh, create content in such a way uh, for a lecture, for example, or for presenting it to learners. Um, and my impression was that um, despite we had a lot of, of innovations there in the last years, a lot of open courseware initiatives at universities, especially here in the US, uh, still uh, there is not so much collaboration. It's uh, often just one uh, course material produced by one person and then made available to the public, but often also not translated in different languages. It's not um, updated uh, for several years then. And um, our idea was here to develop a platform which allows this collaboration around open courseware and gives people possibility uh, to represent open courseware in a very structured way to support this collaboration and crowdsourcing and also versioning and editing and authoring of open courseware. And that's called SlideWiki. Uh, so you can go to slidewiki.org and create uh, presentations. Similarly, as a Dokili, it uses HTML. So a presentation is basically uh, a set of um, slides which are HTML5 snippets. So we see here um, uh, one course um, and you have the uh, hierarchic structure. You can, can organize your course in different elements, course elements, um, and then the notes, the leaves um, of these three are basically the slides. When you click on one slide, uh, you see the uh, content of the slide. You can directly, when you are logged in, edit the content in the slide. You have this WYSIWYG um, HTML rich text editor here. Um, you can also add formulas in um, the LaTeX notation, and then we use the JavaScript library for uh, transforming them into the proper um, HTML representation. You can, can add figures, images, um, and um, lots of other things. Um, uh, one important feature is um, also that uh, translation, because my impression was there is a lot of material available in English, and there are some other big languages like Spanish, also German is pretty, uh, pretty good, where you have a lot of uh, material when you search on the internet, but there are a lot of small languages. You have like Czech, for example, Bulgarian, um, you have lots of African uh, languages in Africa, in Asia, uh, where also the educational systems are not that well developed. Uh, so we need also techniques to make material in these other languages available. And that was one of the primary ideas of, of SlideWiki, um, to enable people to translate. Once they created content, uh, material, open courseware, to make it uh, possible to translate it relatively easily to different languages. So you see that here, when you have created um, a certain lecture material or course material, you can then uh, create a translation and it uses the Google Translate API for translating every individual slide basically. Of course, this is not a perfect translation, but my experience is it saves around 50% of the time. You just have to do a, lit of, uh, a bit of editing afterwards. Many things it gets already correctly. Um, some things or many things you also have to improve manually. But combined also with this crowdsourcing that different people can collaborate uh, on uh, creating a translation, I think it significantly reduces the, the effort required for uh, translating uh, material. And also one important feature is that it keeps track of all the contributions. So you of course have a, a version history, you can see all the revisions, who did what. Um, but you can also uh, see here on the side who contributed uh, to this particular part of the course material uh, or to one particular slide, who created the uh, translation, what sources were used, 
Um, and that helps to um, also keep track and to acknowledge contributions of, of contributors. Because you can use similar features also what you have seen in Dokili. You can create different uh, CSS um, um, views of the slides. Um, you can edit um, inline. You can present, of course, in a full screen mode. I'm using that for, for my lectures. Uh, at the University of Bonn. The students can add comments and um, discuss um, uh, information or improve it. Uh, it's easy to collaborate with others. You always have um, um, a version, um, um, but, but still it's not possible that other, everybody can basically edit and update information, but you never destroy the version of somebody else because we keep track of all versions basically. So you always have your version and then you have um, changes of, of other people and contributions which you can accept in your version um, or you can uh, continue working on your revision. So in the end it's also something a bit like Git or GitHub uh, because you can create branches uh, of, of presentations of material. You can also reuse material so uh, you can drag and drop in this um, uh, tree here on the left hand side um, uh, parts of the, the courseware and uh, to change the, the order, for example, or to add um, material. Um, one important feature is also uh, the addition of questions. So to give learners the possibility to self-assess their knowledge. And that's what uh, you can attach to every slide. You can attach these self-assessment questions, which are basically multiple choice questions. Um, and um, based on these multiple choice questions, which are attached to different slides, you then uh, we automatically create um, tests or um, assessments which students can do. And if they don't, cannot answer uh, certain uh, questions, they are directly pointed also to the content where they should put more focus or emphasis in, in learning um, on there. And when you copy slides from one deck to another or reuse them, also all these self-assessment questions, since they are attached to the slides, they are copied and, um, um, and then always um, available. And here's an example um, of a test which is generated and then you can see basically the scores and um, based on such a, a multiple choice self-assessment and then you are pointed also directly to the parts in the lecture. Um, every slide, every um, deck, every uh, presentation has its own URI or URL so you directly can point uh, people, you can also share this on a, on a chat and you are directly referred to exactly that uh, particular slide or particular question uh, to discuss this with your colleagues or learners. So SlideWiki, of course, there are a number of other um, technologies there, Google Docs presentations, Prezi, SlideShare, uh, but SlideWiki I think is quite different. It focuses on this e-learning, so these Questions are very important. The translation is one uh, important aspect. So we keep also track of the links, when was what translated. And once you update the original slides or courses, uh, then uh, the translator can see basically the differences and then update also the translated content. And it focuses particularly also on this collaboration, uh, helping people to collaborate on, on open courseware. And um, SlideWiki is also an, another example uh, to develop maybe a more tailored and adapted uh, technique for uh, content creation, for content sharing, um, and not just uh, mimicking a traditional, the traditional way was also there, creating presentations in PowerPoint or PDF and then uploading them. Uh, here we want to develop something which is really tailored to the um, digital possibilities. And I think it also goes, often we are asked how does it um, 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 compare with MOOCs, these massive open online courses. And of course we have a lot of these MOOCs, um, but creating a MOOC is also very expensive. It costs a lot of effort, um, I think $200,000, $300,000 uh, to create uh, one MOOC. And we see SlideWiki could be also a tool uh, to prepare the content which later could emerge and become part of a, of a MOOC. Uh, currently we work on an EU project on creating the next version of the SlideWiki platform. So what I showed you here on these slides this is actually the um, uh, the first version uh, which was developed 
uh, five, six, or started to develop five, six years ago. Um, in the web age, things change so rapidly that we have so many new opportunities, possibilities, uh, that we now decided to do a completely re-implementation of SlideWiki. We'll, of course, copy all the content from the current version because there are thousands of uh, courses uh, already available. So even if you create um, something on the current version, it will be available then also on the new one due to the HTML uh, five representation, this is relatively straightforward, uh, but the technology, the architecture of the software behind the platform um, is currently redeveloped and we hope that towards the end of the year we uh, will be SlideWiki 2.0, uh, which is much more faster and also easier to use. We put more emphasis on usability um, and um, will then add in the next two years uh, further features uh, to the platform. Overall, um, to recap now a bit, my impression is that um, if you look also at semantic technology area, uh, the world changed quite a lot in the last 15 years. So this is the semantic web layer cake uh, 15 years ago, and we see there is a lot of emphasis on logic, on uh, proof, on reasoning. Uh, I think it turned out that often uh, more simpler or, or simple techniques, for example, identification of things, um, also relatively simple querying and vocabularies are already very helpful and a little semantics goes a long way and that's why I created a new version of this layer cake and I think the, one of the biggest differences also that we have more of these bindings to different technology areas. Previously uh, it was monolithically based on RDF XML or on XML basically and now we have many more of these other uh, languages and technology ecosystems like JSON, which is very common in web development areas. Also big data applications use a lot of JSON and with JSON LD, we can bind and bridge uh, this to RDF. Uh, we can add CSV and there's this uh, W3C working group to define this mapping language, uh, CSV to RDF. Uh, we have mappings for relational databases, which is very important because they are um, and will be used uh, in the industry. Um, and of course RDFA um, and uh, RDFA is, is really important to uh, have an integrated view of human and machine readable uh, information uh, which was heavily used for example in, in Dokili um, to um, integrate semantics and um, human readable information. Yeah, so overall I think um, uh, we are still in the, in the beginning of an area uh, of using all these possibilities of digitization and there many is much more work required to be done uh, to make really create such an ecosystem of open scholarly communication infrastructure. Um, I think there are three particular um, areas which require a lot of attention like authoring environments um, and that's a bit I showed you three examples basically Dokili supports this authoring um, also the semantic wiki for an open research for events um, uh, is an authoring environment and slide wiki of course as well and I think we need more tailored authoring environments supporting this collaboration, this crowdsourcing and uh, also the specific structure of the content, a rich semantic structure. Um, and then um, research information systems I think are very um, important ingredient to give an overview of um, metadata information, who is working on what, what organizations, what events are there. Um, and we should not only look at it from an organizational viewpoint, uh, but also from uh, maybe uh, viewpoints of different research communities. And I think if we can show this, how uh, research uh, information stored in these research information systems can be created to create different or, or used to create different views for, for different communities and different perspectives, a regional perspective for example, uh, who is working on which topics in a certain region. I think um, that uh, will have a great value. And then also improving this publishing, um, adding more stars, not only to the data, but also to documents, to courseware, uh, to also artifacts which we share uh, to make them rich, interlinked, um, semantically represented. Uh, so overall coming more from a document centricity to a more knowledge uh, centric uh, viewpoint. I think that's what 
uh, the challenge we face a bit in, in the area of scholarly communication. And I think we are f still far away. Um, there are, um, besides the examples I showed, there are of course lots of other uh, examples and lots of other uh, approaches in that, uh, in that uh, area. But I think uh, still uh, there is a lot of work to do and we need to try out and uh, play around with, with many more of these uh, technologies and infrastructures. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I also want to point you to these two guys. I mentioned Zarin Kabadisli already. Uh, he's the guy behind Dokili and uh, Linked Research. And then my colleague Christoph Lange, uh, who also works a lot in this area um, and is the technical editor of the Kerr Workshop Proceedings, one of the largest open uh, access repositories, which now goes also towards more semantic metadata and implementing uh, one piece of this whole life cycle of uh, semantic or data value chains in the scholarly communication area. Yeah, thank you very much. And I hope we have some time for questions and discussion. We do have time for questions. If anyone has questions. I have a question. Yeah. You know, it seems we're trying to make this data machine readable, um, and we're all working on that. At the same time, it seems the machines are getting good at reading non-machine readable language, um, even to the point to where if a Google bot comes to my web page, I can give it RDF XML or I can give it HTML. I think it prefers my HTML over my RDF XML because it's trusted more, because more eyes have seen it. And given that, I mean, it's sort of, what, is there a way that we can leverage that? It seems to me it's great that we're producing machine readable language, but at the same time, these machines are getting better at reading non machine readable language and understanding it anyway. Well, I mean, what do you think about that? And is that something we can take advantage of and help to make our lives easier? Yeah, I think we need we need both. Yeah, I think we need to put humans and machines in the loop. <laughs> and you're right, machines are getting better, but I'm still skeptic they will will be able to understand the information in the same way ever as as we as humans do. Um, so I think there are so many ambiguities in in text, and um, I think there are also so many questions currently we cannot answer. So if you ask the example I gave you. Give me uh, link discovery approaches, lose less link discovery approaches implemented in Java, which use DBpedia as a data set, you will not get any answer from Google. And I doubt that um, soon, even uh, though we have this improved, uh, we have now deep learning and we have all these new NLP um, techniques, but I doubt they will be able to really answer such kind of questions. So, of course, they might answer more and more questions, that's right, but um, I still think we need also to invest the effort or make it um, not always it, uh, it is really required. For example, in DBpedia, uh, we extract this information also from, from Wikipedia, and the Wikipedians, they actually curate the DBpedia database, yeah? so they don't even know that they curate a, a data and knowledge base, but they still do it indirectly. And I think we need to develop such kind of techniques where it doesn't add too much of a burden uh, to the users, but still they generate more structured and semantic content, which then can be exploited in conjunction with these automatic uh, techniques. Yeah, I know that um, semantic media wikis, they allow you to import ontologies, so you know, we can actually start having regular, consistent, structured schemas. Are you doing that with your open research wiki? Like, do you import, you know, FOF and Bibbo and other ontologies, or do you kind of create your own structures? Yeah, we uh, reuse some of them, but uh, we primarily link also to, to existing vocabularies and ontologies. So FOF, definitely, I think you should have seen that in my uh, in the profile I showed. There was a uh, fo uh, there were some some FOF uh, elements in there and. Um, but uh, for s certain information, we also basically developed an own ontology. We try now to align it. It's also work in progress. And everybody actually can also contribute to this. Um, um, there you can, in Semantic Media Wiki, also add uh, links then, same as links, and things to other vocabularies. Thank you. So thank you very much for presenting us uh, open research. I, find it, I, fi I found it great. and. 
So are you going or maybe are you using some identifiers for the conferences or events? You know, like the German uh, National Library has a large collection of um, conference metadata. Are you going to use uh, these IDs or yep. identifiers? That's a, a good question. We don't use it yet, but we definitely want to do that. So that's a very good suggestion. So we will try to link that. And um, the nice thing about this semantic media wiki is that the, the model behind it is very flexible. So it can evolve. We already changed this a lot. We actually developed the first version of it uh, four or five years ago. Uh, and now we, in the last half a year, we did a lot of work of um, updating, upgrading that, adding more data, and also the data model can basically evolve over time. We can add more uh, links to other related data sets, and uh, that's definitely something we, which we plan for, uh, for the next months. Thank you very much. I hope um, um, I will be able to use your conference data for, uh, you know, for the conferences in vivo, for example. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I want to know if you have had some experience doing uh, data extraction from images or audiovisual products, uh, not just metadata, but I mean extraction for colors or an and doing the integration of that uh, semantically? No, we didn't uh, work on, on this. You mean from like, like images? For example, images um, just take colors or faces mm. um, and, and, or movies to, to, to do data extraction from subtitles or captions. Um, we, my group, not, but we have colleagues at Fraunhofer, at uh, our institute, Fraunhofer IAS, uh, there is uh, Joachim Köhler, and they work a lot, for example, uh, they, for, for the German public broadcasters, uh, they uh, do transcription of all the, uh, the videos and also scene recognition, so, um, but we didn't work on, on this um, area here, but it's definitely would be interesting with SlideWiki. Um, there are also platforms like, um, how's it called, the one from, from Slovenia, uh, where you have basically videos of, of presentations, of talks. Uh, and I lost the name, but um, it definitely would be very interesting to, to synchronize that also like if you have video lectures is the name, right? If you have video lectures and then maybe content which is published at the platform like SlideWiki. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Saren Auer. Let's give him a hand.